Yep. It's finally happening. Castle Crashers. I really love this game. Could you tell? Castle Crashers was that indie beat-em-up. Developed by the indie studio The Behemoth, released back in August of 2008 on the Xbox Live Arcade. It would later release on the PS3 in 2010, and would come to PC in September of 2012, eventually even getting a remaster in 2015 on Xbox One, and then four years later in 2019 for the PlayStation 4 and the Switch, why did it take so long to come out on those consoles? I don't know, I guess they forgot. This game, it's special to me. It is pretty much ingrained into my childhood, and between Castle Crashers and Bioshock, it is my favorite game of all time. I've been playing this game since I was like six on my old PS3. Oh my god, in a few months I'll have to pay taxes. Despite that, I still suck ass at this game. But this game just means a lot to me, and so that is why I decided to make a video on it today. For this video, I will be using the remaster and the PC version of the game, just because it is the most accessible version of the game for me. And I am also using the official Castle Crushers wiki for any bonus information like stats and whatnot, because surprisingly, it's pretty good, unlike most of the other wikis. So, let's stop wasting time and just get into the masterpiece known as Castle Crushers. <laughs> So when you open up the game, not only do you get hit with an amazing soundtrack, you can be greeted by a few modes you can choose from. Back off Barbarian, Arena, and Castle Crashers. Now this is of course in the remastered version. If you are an OG player, you probably remember the PS3 and Xbox 360 exclusive modes. On the Xbox 360, you had all you can quaff. Yeah, we'll get to that one later. And for the PS3, you had a volleyball minigame. However, we are going to start with Castle Crashers, which is the main campaign. <laughs> Before we discuss anything about the game, we need to discuss the basics, like the main gameplay loop. So Castle Crashers again is a side-scrolling 2D beat-em-up. When playing the game, you can choose from an assortment of 31 different characters, each one with their own magic abilities, from splash attacks to projectiles, and a magic jump. Still not sure what these do besides looking cool. And after selecting your character, you can fight enemies with a huge arsenal of weapons. 84 in fact, each one with either buffs or debuffs onto your character, and some have a special boost that can affect enemies. You even have these floating animal things that follow you around and give you a specific boost. Now of course, with the objective of killing enemies, you have a set of attacks. You have yourself a light attack which can be done by pressing the X or square button, with a heavy attack that can be done by pressing the Y button or triangle button. Pressing the left trigger, however, can have your character pull out a shield to protect you. Yes, there is a shield in the game and I always forget to use it, and this is the last time I will ever mention the shield, goodbye. And if you hold down the right trigger, you can have this little mist around your character, and can activate your magic. Pressing Y or triangle while holding the right trigger, you can use your splash attack. Press B or circle would let you throw your projectile. The controls on Xbox and PlayStation are very normal for a video game, but then you have the PC controls for keyboard, what the actual fuck is this? Who the hell uses arrow keys to move? The other aspect to the gameplay loop for combat is the combos. You can unlock more of these combos the more you level up, and there's a good bit of them. Not nearly as much compared to your usual fighting game, however, there's still a decent amount. The Castle Crashers fighting game actually sounds like it'd be a lot of fun. Hey Behemoth, please hire me. I don't know how to code, but I have good ideas, I promise. There is a throw combo. This attack is genuinely my favorite, especially in a later level. Just walk up to an enemy, press the Y or triangle button, and boom, he will now suffer from the American healthcare system. You can even headbutt enemies, and it looks funny. Then you got your other normal attacks like an uppercut, a spinning uppercut, and other spin attacks. You can even juggle enemies and constantly combo their ass without mercy. Now with the basics of the combat and everything down, let's move on to the next topic. Let's discuss the playable characters within Castle Crushers, with there being 31 in total. Surely I wouldn't talk about all of them. I'm going to talk about all of them. So let's start. Green Knight. He's alright, I guess. His starting weapon is the Thin Sword, and his elemental power is poison. His splash attack is a poison blast. His magic projectile is a poison ball. With Which, by the way, magic projectiles can also be used in the air, which is sometimes useful. And his magic jump, of course, 
poison jump. And if you for some reason couldn't tell, his abilities can poison people. I know, mind shattering stuff. Green Knight is okay, I don't think he is bad, but I never could have play him if I'm given the choice. Now on to Red Knight, my second favorite knight in the whole game. He is actually really good, his starting weapon is a mace, with his element power being electricity. The splash attack is Thunderbolt, which lasts as long as you have your mana up, or whatever that blue bar is called. The magic and air projectile is a charged shot, which is also pretty good. And the magic jump is called a lightning pillar, and is... It, it's, yeah, I don't know what it is. Now, Blue Knight. He is also a really good character in the game. His starting weapon is a sheath sword. For a splash attack, you can throw ice shards at people. For a projectile, he throws an ice bolt. But his air projectile is just like a splash attack being ice shard. And his ice jump is just really fucking cool. Blue is really cool. I like Blue Knight. However, this next knight is my all-time favorite and clears all of the playable characters in every conceivable way. My main, Orange Knight. He is my favorite. I bet you couldn't tell that one. His starting weapon is a broad axe. His elemental powers are fire. His splash attack is a flame blast. And the magic and air projectiles are a fireball. With his magic jump just being a fire jump or something. Orange Knight is my favorite. I love him. He has always been my favorite ever since I was younger, hence the profile picture. And he's also really good. Personally, I think he is the best, but that is definitely up for debate. Now that is all for the main knights that you can play as right from the start. So now we got to move on to the rest of the knights. Pink Knight. They're fine, I guess. In the remastered version, Pink Knight is available off the rip. Unless you are on PC, because then you got to cough up a dollar. Pink Knight has no elemental abilities. Actually, the rest of them really don't. I think only two of them do. But look at him. He's so happy. The starting weapon is a new Grounds Lollipop. Yeah, that's what it's called. The splash attack is a rainbow. Pink Knight's magic and air projectile is just chucking stuffed animals at people. And their magic jump is whatever the fuck this thing is. Now, Purple Knight, or also known as the Blacksmith. He is really cool looking. He looks badass. The starting weapon is a hammer with the abilities being non-elemental and also fire, apparently. His splash attack is this stupid-ass frog, and his magic projectile is a flaming hammer. But the air projectile is the dumb frog again. And his magic jump is a springboard. And now Hattie Haddington. Yeah, they added the fucker from Battle Block here. Hattie's abilities are non-elemental, and the starting weapon is an emerald sword. The splash attack is a whale dropping stuff on people. The magic projectile is called Tears of a Pansy. And his air projectile is just a big ass gem. His jump though is kind of lame. He just grows wings. Hattie is just kind of okay. Never someone I would want to play a lot, but I guess he's not the worst. But he's definitely not my favorite. Then you got Grey Knight. His starting weapon is a skinny sword, with his abilities being non-elemental. His splash attack is Arrow Rain, with the magic and air projectiles being a literal bomb. With his jump j just being a regular jump where dust just comes out of nowhere. And then you got the most pointless character in the game, Open Face Grey Knight, where the only difference in ability is instead of a bomb, it's a dagger. I don't really care for either of these guys, but why is there two of them? You also have the Barbarian, starting weapon is a Barbarian Axe, his splash attack is a bunch of weapons being chucked at an enemy, and his projectiles are an axe, with his magic jump being like Grey Knights. There's the Thief. Their starting weapon is a Thieves Sword. The splash attack is making it rain arrows. And the projectiles are a knife. They also have a dust jump, just like Grey Knight and Barbarian. The Fencer. His starting weapon is a fencing sword or something, with the splash attack being a saw trap. And the projectiles having you throw saw blades. And his jump being some weird smoke. And this guy's actually pretty good. Probably one of the top tier ones for me. But then there's the beekeeper. This guy looks funny. His starting weapon is called a rat beating bat. Splash attack is making it rain bees. A lot of these splash attacks is just making it rain something from what I've noticed. And the projectiles are throwing bees at people. The industrialist is also pretty cool. Starting weapon being the ugly mace. Splash attack is also the... 
the saw trap for some reason, and also has buzz saws as their projectile. Seeing a bit of overlap here. Also has the same magic jump as the fencer. Wait, so why do both of these characters exist? We also have the alien, which is a cute little nod to the behemoth's previous game, Alien Hominid. The starting weapon is an alien gun. Splash attack is a comet, with the projectile being a laser gun. And the magic jump is just a tractor beam. I like the alien. He may not be great, but he's fun and adorable. You could even play as the king. <laughs> the starting weapon is a king's mace. His splash attack is called king's healing, which is an ability that can heal you, which is really interesting. And I'm pretty sure he's the only character that can do this. And the projectile is a gold knife. His magic jump, though, is pretty boring. It's called a kingly jump, but it's just... This? There is the brew. He's kind of okay. Starting weapon is a dual pronged sword. Splash attack is thorny vines, and his projectile is an acorn, and their magic jump is a vine jump. Then you got Snakey, who I think is pretty cool looking. The starting weapon is a snaky mace, his splash attack is thorny vines just like the brute, but his projectile is a dagger, and his magic jump is also just a vine jump. Then we got... Saracen. Yeah, let's go with that. For starting weapon, we got the Falchion. Splash attack is a sandstorm. The magic projectile is just a gust of sand, however the air projectile is also a sandstorm, and his magic jump is, of course, a dust jump. We got the Royal Guard, who also has the Falchion as a starting weapon. The splash attack is Arrow Rain, and his projectiles are bombs, so he's immediately S tier. But he also has a dust jump, just like the other characters. There is also a Stove Face, with the Gladiator Sword for a starting weapon. Splash attack is Arrow Rain, and projectile is a knife, and again, another knight with the dust jump. And then there's a peasant we can play as. Starting weapon is a wooden spoon, the greatest weapon of all time. Splash attack is another one with arrow rain and another character that has daggers as a projectile. And again, another dust jump. Then we got the very violent furry. Starting weapon is a club. Splash attack is a tornado. Magic projectile is a wind ball, but the air projectile is also a tornado. And their magic jump is a wind jump. I guess. Now this one is probably my top three favorites out of all the characters in the game, the Necromancer. He looks really cool and I love his design. His abilities are also really cool. The starting weapon is called an evil sword, with his splash attack just spawning his skeleton hands out of the ground to grab people. And his projectile is called a kamikaze skeleton, and he just goes and attacks people. His magic jump is called a skeletal jump. He's great, I love him. Then we got the cone. I think they're alright, I guess. The starting weapon is a lightsaber. Yeah, we'll get to that one later. Flash attack is yet another arrow rain, and yet another character that can bomb people. And he has a dust jump, but who cares at this point? You can even play as a regular civilian. And look at him. He's stupid. Starting weapon is a pitchfork, with his flash attack being an arrow rain, and projectiles being a dagger. And yes... He does in fact have a dust jump. We also got ourselves a fire demon, one of the few non-knight characters that has elemental abilities, and it is just fire. The starting weapon is a black morning star. The splash attack is basically a better flame blast. Projectiles are a fireball, and of course he has a flame jump. Another cool character is the skeleton. Starting weapon is a skeletor mace. The splash attack is... whatever the hell this is. The projectile is white stuff and the magic jump is a shadow jump i guess it's called pillar of darkness but shadow jump sounds better another elemental character that is not a knight the ice gamo starting weapon is a fishing spear with a splash attack being ice shards and his projectile is a snowball with the magic jump being a snow jump then we got the ninja starting weapon is a sigh splash attack is a smoke screen and his projectiles are shurikens with his magic jump just being a smoke jump. And the final playable character of the game, the Colt Minion. Their starting weapon is a strange looking glow stick. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. The Colt Minion's abilities are all just the skeletons. All of them. He even throws white stuff at people. So yeah, if you couldn't catch on, there is a lot of overlap with the abilities. And it does make sense. It would be insanely hard to create unique abilities for all 31 characters. But to unlock most of these characters, you need to either beat certain arenas or beat the game with a specific character. 
A few of them though, you just need to be a certain level on insane mode, at least on the PC and remastered. But now we gotta talk about a big part of the gameplay, being the stats and XP system. <laughs> So another important part to the gameplay being the stats and the XP. When you start out in the game, you aren't that strong. Of course, you are strong enough to be able to actually fight enemies. As you do your thing in the game and beat the shit out of people, you can get XP. And of course, if you fill your XP bar to the max, you can of course, just like in any game, level up. It's nothing earth shattering. Every time you hit an enemy, you pretty much get XP towards leveling up. And when you level up in the middle of a fight, you heal all of your health back, which is great. It is very helpful, especially during a fight. At the end of each mission, whether that be you dying or completing it, you can be met with a screen showing four different attributes to upgrade if you leveled up. Strength, Magic, Defense, and Agility. Strength is the damage you do, which makes it of course take less hits to kill something. If you are someone that cares about leveling up quicker, I recommend not upgrading this unless you have to, because the less hits needed to kill an enemy, the less XP gain. Magic of course affects your magic abilities, this can unlock you previously locked magic abilities for the character you are using, lowering how much of the blue bar is taken when using your magic, and I th also think the damage from magic attacks is also increased with this. Then there is defense. Every skill point used can increase your health by 28 HP. It can also decrease flinch speed when getting hit, and increase resistance to damage. And finally, you got agility. Using skill points on this can, for some reason, increase the damage of the bow, because yes, you have a bow, and even its rate of fire, and of course, the player's speed. Whenever I play, I usually always go for magic and defense first, and then agility, I tend to forget to upgrade a lot, but you should really upgrade all of them as much as you can. But if you are not a good player, I recommend going for defense first and prioritizing that because if you're anything like me, or worse, you will get fucked up badly. This XP system is nothing crazy or really unique, but I think it is implemented pretty well here. It's good, although there is no level scaling at all in the game, so you can farm those earlier levels to level up as much as you want, and making every boss fight irrelevant. Now let's move on to another key component to Castle Crashers, the weapons. <laughs> weapons, am I right? We all love them. We all need them. And in Castle Crashers, obviously, they are important. So there are a total of 84 weapons in this game. Each weapon is different, sort of. See, every single weapon in the game can affect your stats in some way. Weapons can either improve or impair your character, or at least the specific stats. Some can make your strength go up, some can make it go down. Some can either have only one upside, or downside to them, or even both. And some can just have nothing at all. Weapons can even have a special ability, kind of, where they have a bit of a boost when you attack something, like an increased chance at crit damage, or a chance to light someone on fire, or a chance at electrocuting someone. Also, weapons can be locked to a certain character level, so if you aren't a high enough level, you cannot pick up the weapon. Like, if a weapon requires you to be level 10 and you are level 7, then you can't pick it up. With there being 84 weapons in the game, they are separated into 11 groups. For some reason, the groups of weapons in the original and remastered are different, and I don't really know why. But just like the rest of this video, I will be using the remastered versions groups. So group one, this group only has four weapons. You have the thin sword. It gives you plus one agility, and that's it. The mace has no stat effect, but can give a 1% chance of crit damage. The sheathed sword gives a plus one in magic. And for some reason, the alien gun is here and it has no stat effects, but apparently gives a 1% chance of lighting someone on fire, I guess. All of the weapons in this group require you to be level 1 to use, so pretty much can be used right out the gate. Group 2. This group has 6 total weapons within it. The Broad Axe. This weapon gives you plus 1 in strength. The Skinny Sword. It has negative 1 in strength, but plus 1 in defense, and plus 1 in agility. The Barbarian Axe has negative 1 in magic, however, it gives you a 1% crit rate. Then you got the Pitchfork, which gives plus 1 in strength, 
but takes away one in agility. Then you have the Wrapped Sword. Aside from looking stupid, it takes away one in strength, but gives one in magic and defense. And then you got the Meat Tenderizer, giving two in strength and taking away one in agility. All of these weapons can also be used at a level one. So again, you can use these weapons on a new character you never played before. So now we are on to group three, with a total of eight weapons in this group. And as you can tell, with each group, there is more weapons in it than there was in the last one. We have the Twig. This weapon gives plus two in magic, but takes away one in defense. And then the Leafy Twig. A significantly worse version of the Twig. I didn't even think it was possible. Takes away one in magic, one in defense, and gives back a measly one in agility. If you use this, I do not want to be anywhere near you. A wooden spoon, truly peak weapon design, taking away one in magic, but gives you back two in agility. It's not horrible, although I wouldn't call it great. But then we get a fishing rod. It takes away one in strength and uh, gives 1% chance in electrocuting someone. I want to know how that is possible. What is the science behind that? Then there is the Newgrounds Lollipop, which is probably one of the best starting weapons in the game. It has no debuffs. It just gives you plus 5 in agility. It looks stupid and gives you a good boost. No reason not to use it if you're starting out the game. The Broccoli Sword. It gives 3 in defense. It's not bad. I didn't even think it was that good either, to be honest, though. The Emerald Sword. It gives 3 in magic, but it does take away 1 in agility. And finally, the Hammer. It gives you 3 in strength, but takes away 1 for agility. And that is all the weapons within Group 3. All the weapons here can also be used right out the gate. Now we got ourselves Group 4 with a total of 9 weapons. We have ourselves the Half Sword. Minus 1 in magic, but plus 2 in defense. The Carrot. Plus 1 in strength plus one in defense, and it's a carrot. There is the Thief's Sword, taking away one in strength, but gives three in agility. And then a fish, it takes away one in magic, but it has 2% chance of freezing people. That's one cold ass fish. You can even beat people to death with a leaf. It takes away one in strength, but it gives back three in magic. There is even a lobster here. Look at him, he's so happy and cute. Minus one in strength, but plus one in agility, and 1% of crit damage. An umbrella! A weapon Death's Door would shamelessly steal 13 years later. Minus 1 in strength, but plus 1 in defense. And of course, a wrench. Something Castle Crashers would shamelessly steal from Bioshock a year later. It gives 1% in strength, while taking away 1 in magic, and gives 2% chance of dealing crit damage. And the final weapon of Group 4, the Chicken Shit. Wait, that's not right. The Chicken Stick. It takes away 1 in defense, but gives back 2 in magic and 1 in agility. And then it's also a chicken, so it's funny. All of the weapons in this group require you to be at level 5 to use, however. Now on to group 5, there is a total of 9 weapons within this group as well. Scissors adds 3 onto defense, but takes off 1 agility. Requires you to be at least level 5 to use. A wooden sword adds 1 onto strength and agility. And this is the last weapon within group 5 to require you to be at least level 5. The rest of the weapons in this group require you to be level 10. We got the Pumpkin Peeler. Gives 3 in strength, 2 in defense, but it takes away 2 in magic. An overall alright weapon. The Zigzag. It adds 3 for magic, 1 for defense, but it takes away 1 in agility. The Falchion. Gives 1 in strength and three in defense. A pretty good weapon, especially when you get toward the middle of the game. Fencer's Foil gives one on strength, magic, and agility, so it's not terrible. The Apple Peeler takes away one in strength, but does add one in magic and three in defense. The Rubber Handle Sword gives two on strength and three on agility. However, taking away two on magic, but this is still a good weapon in my opinion. And finally, the Refined Mace adds one onto everything except for magic. Magic. And that is all for group 5. This group had a good bit of decent weapons in my opinion. Now we are on group 6 with a total of 9 weapons. We got the Clunky Mace. Gives you plus 5 strength at a sacrifice of 2 agility. A Rat Beating Bat. Gives you plus 2 strength and plus 1 defense. Practice Foil gives you 1 in magic and 3 in agility, however taking away 1 in defense. One of my favorite weapons, uh, a literal lightsaber, 
gives 2 in agility and a 2% chance of electrocuting enemies. It's not the best weapon by any means, but I still love it because it's a lightsaber. A staff gives 5 in magic, takes away 2 in defense. A kibasa, yes you can beat people with a literal sausage, get with the times. Gives you plus 1 in strength and magic and a 1% chance of crit damage. That's a rock hard sausage. The lightning bolt, gives 3 in magic and a 1% chance of electrocuting people. A literal 2x4. It gives 2 in strength and defense while taking 1 away from magic. And the final weapon of the group, Thick Sword. Plus 5 in defense, plus 2 in strength, but minus 1 in magic. And this is the only sword in the group to require you to be at least level 15 to use, but it's decent. For group 7, there is also a total of 9 weapons. The Gladiator Sword, plus 3 in defense, 1 in strength, but it does take away 1 in magic. But it also has a 2% chance of crit damage, so it's not bad. A Giant Butcher Knife. Plus 5 in strength, plus 2 in agility, and minus 2 in magic. A gold sword has plus 4 in magic and plus 1 in defense. Not bad. The Plato Pasta Maker. Yeah, that's the real name. Plus 3 in magic and defense with minus 1 in agility. Pointy sword, plus 2 in defense and agility, and plus 1 in magic. The chewed up sword, minus 1 in magic with plus 4 in defense and plus 2 in agility. And then there is the curved sword, with plus 3 in strength and magic, with minus 1 in defense. And then a key sword, in case you feel like Sora today. Plus 3 in magic and agility, with minus 1 strength. And probably one of my top 3 favorite weapons in the game, Bone Leg. Minus 2 in strength, yes, but plus 5 in agility and a 2% chance of poisoning your victims, and it's a bone leg. We are now onto group 8. We got such good weapons like the fishing spear. Plus 5 in strength, 2 in magic, but minus 3 in agility, which is kind of cringe. The lance. Plus 4 in strength, plus 2 in defense, and minus 2 in agility. Then you got a goddamn unicorn horn. Yeah, this game is pretty crazy. Minus 3 in strength, however, plus 6 in magic and plus 1 in defense. You can even beat people with Lumiere. Minus 1 in strength, plus 2 in magic, and 3% chance of burning people. A Panic Mallet. Plus 1 in strength with 3% chance of crit damage. Yeah, that's it. It's not a great weapon, to be honest. A Broad Spear. Minus 2 in strength with plus 5 in agility and a 2% chance of crit damage. A Fork with a Meatball on it. Gives plus 3 in magic, but minus 2 in defense, but and 1% chance of poisoning enemies. Honestly, out of all the weapons with specific boost, this one makes the most sense. And the final weapon of Group A is a Cardboard Tube. Minus 2 in strength, but plus 6 in agility but is it really worth it and here with group 9 there is only seven weapons in total like the dual prong sword plus three in strength and defense and a one percent chance of crit damage it's pretty good a club plus five in strength and defense at a loss of three agility the ugly mace minus two in magic but plus six in defense and one percent chance of crit damage the skeletor mace minus two in strength but with plus three in defense and plus five in agility i think that more than makes up for the less damage a snaky mace plus five in magic minus two in defense and plus three in agility and a 2% chance of poisoning enemies, again, another solid weapon. Then there is the Black Morning Star. This weapon is ass and is the only one that I think is actually bad besides the leafy twig. Plus 1 in magic and defense and a 4% chance of a crit rate. Sounds nice and all, until you realize you lose 3 points in strength. Is that worth it to you? Then you got the King's Mace, which is one of the better weapons in the game. Plus 3 in strength and defense and plus 2 in magic. It's great. And that's all the weapons for group 9. Every weapon here requires you to be at least level 20 to use. Now on to group 10. There is a total of 7 weapons within this group. You got the Psy. Minus 2 in defense and plus 6 in agility with 2% chance of crit damage. But another weapon I love. The Ribeye. Plus 4 in strength and agility at the cost of 2 magic. A tier weapon. Then there is the Evil Sword. Which might just genuinely be a top 2 sword. Plus 2 in magic, plus 7 in defense. That is insane. Why does it have that much defense? The ice sword has plus 2 in magic and 3% chance of freezing enemies. Then the glow stick. Listen, I see plus 5 in magic and defense, but the minus 4 in strength is a huge turnoff. I don't care if it can electrocute someone. There is also the demon sword. Hey look, the sword from the thumbnail. Look at that. I really love the sword. It's not the best. Far from it. I just think it looks really cool. It's got plus 2 for everything except for defense, and it can also burn people as well. 
It's probably a B tier sword if I would rank it. And the final weapon of the group, the wooden mace. Plus two for everything except for magic. And it's not bad, it's alright. And that is every weapon from group 10. All of these weapons also require you to be at least level 20 to use. Now we are on to the final group of weapons with a total of 8 weapons. These are some of the best weapons in the game. Like the Golden Skull Mace. It only has plus 3 in strength and 4% chance of crit damage. But it feels so powerful to use. The Newgrounds Golden Sword. Plus 5 in damage and magic but minus 3 in agility. It's still really good despite the sacrifice and agility, however it's not the greatest weapon. The chainsaw, yes a fucking chainsaw, plus 5 in defense and a 5% chance of crit damage, this thing is a monster. The buffalo mace, plus 5 in strength, plus 3 in defense and minus 2 in agility, a very solid weapon. The electric eel, plus 4 in magic, minus 1 in defense and 3% chance of electrocuting stuff. Probably one of the worst ones out of this group, but it's still pretty good. A cattle rod, plus 4 in defense and 4% chance of electrocuting stuff. Pretty good weapon. Then there is a weapon called the man catcher. Can it really catch men? Plus 5 in strength and 2 in defense and a 2% chance of crit damage. And the final weapon of the game, the ninja claw. Plus 3 in magic and plus 5 in agility and 3% chance of poisoning enemies. I love it, it's fun. These last two weapons require you to be at least level 35 in order to use, and that is all the weapons in the game. I wouldn't say there are any bad ones. Would I be lying? Absolutely! There's quite a bit of good ones, however, a lot of them just tend to look cool. So yeah, with the weapons finally done, thank god, let's move on to the next feature of the game, the animal orbs. So now we got the next big part of the game, the animal orbs. I just call them pets because that's really what they are. They are just creatures that can be found within the game, with each one providing you with some sort of benefit, and they will just float near you and they are so cute. There is a total of 29 of these fuckers because of course there is. First up, the beholder. This horrifying little creature can increase your magic by 4, which is actually really good. This is probably one of my favorite ones in the whole game. The Bipolar Bear. He can maul enemies with 8% of their HP left. However, he can also maul you or your allies if they have 11 HP or less. He's just like me for real. Then you got the Bitey Bat, and they're just kind of okay. It can go over the enemy's head and bite them, keeping them in place and doing a tiny bit of damage. I don't know though, it just doesn't seem very effective. Burly Bear. I love Burly Bear. We stand Burly Bear. Burly Bear Supremacy. He gives you plus 3 in strength and plus 1 in defense. Like, why wouldn't you use him? That's really powerful. Cardinal. He's just kind of mid. He can bring you 5 hidden items on different levels. Like, thanks, I guess. <laughs> Behemoth Chicken. Plus 1 in defense, strength, and agility. A tier pet for real. Then we got Dragon Head. He can periodically shoot fireballs at enemies doing 61 damage within one hit. And he just kinda sucks. To those that spent the 1100 gold in the insane shop to unlock him, I pity you. So Froglet. He can use his tongue to pick up items and hold them underneath him. However, they can still disappear from him so it's useless. But then there's Giraffe. The wiki has a tier list ranking of all the animal orbs, and they got Giraffe at 24. This dude gives you 10% more XP, and honestly, yeah, the ranking is kind of justified. If you are still underpowered by the time you can get him for whatever reason, then sure, he's decent. But honestly, getting better at the game is also effective, so pick your poison. The Golden Whale. He drops gold every 12 to 17 seconds. He sucks, get him out of here. Hawkster. He can attack enemies on the ground and retrieve fruit from enemies that were killed. So he's pretty good, I guess. So install ball. I hate this fucking thing. I want him gone. <laughs> Meowbert. I love Meowbert. I wish more people were like Meowbert. Gives plus four in agility. So monkey face. He's pretty solid. Increases the chances to drop gold, food, and weapons. Wouldn't say he is top tier or even my favorite, but he is pretty good. Mr. Buddy. Mr. Buddy. Mr. Buddy, this dude is so useless, allows you to dig faster, something you're rarely gonna need to do. Owlet, every time I read or hear his name, I think of the Pokemon Rowlet. Owlet is now canonically the Pokemon Rowlet, automatic S tier. He can just find hidden fruit 
in the trees and such, but yeah, he is solid. Then there is Pazo, or Pazo, I don't know how you pronounce it. When a buried item is on screen, he will hover over it and scratch the ground where it's at. That is useless. Pelter, he looks adorable, but he sucks. Piggy, he can increase health gain from eating food. Very good, A tier. Rami is not a great pet, but I still love him. He periodically just rams people, and it's just funny. He loves attacking people. Scratchpaw, the worst of the pet names, but plus two in strength and agility, so it is a good pet. So Seahorse can let you move through water faster. Yeah, wait till he realizes there's barely any water that you need to walk through in the game. Sherbet, that is the best name out of all the pets, and he allows you to jump higher. Solid pet, B tier. Then we got Snailbert, but he gives plus 5 in defense, but you lose 2 in agility. He is the one that got buffed the most in the remaster and PC released. It used to be plus 5 defense, but minus 5 agility. So the fact that it's only minus 2 is actually a crazy good buff, but he is like the only one that has a downside. Snoot! He gives plus 4 in strength. Why would you not take him? An adorable elephant that is also really good. It's a win-win. So, Spiny. Basically Snailbert, but without a downside. Plus 4 defense. That's it. Yeah, it's one less than Snailbert, but he doesn't have a downside, so why would you take Snailbert? Then you got the Troll. Recovers 1% health every 10 seconds. So... I mean, I guess it's alright. Yeti. Prevents you from being frozen by ice attacks and gives damage resistance to ice attacks. That is actually amazing when you think about it. Even though there's not a lot of areas where you're gonna get hit by ice attacks, that is really good. Zebra. Can find fruit and grass patches 100% of the time. That's not horrible. It is useful, but I wouldn't say it's great. I do love the animal orbs, though. They are all adorable. Some of them. But unlike the weapons and characters, there's very clearly some useless ones here that just suck. And quite a bit of them. But they are definitely a useful addition to the game to make your character even better and help you progress through the game better. With all of that covered, though... Let's move on to the regular items and stores of the game. So the final gameplay thing that I want to talk about before the bosses and stuff, tools and items. There is a good bit of them. First off, the tools. You have the health potion, and as the name suggests, it heals you. It fully restores the player's health, however, you can only have five at one time. There is a boomerang. It's fun. It can break barriers, it can stun enemies, and apparently can be used for XP glitching. So yeah, that's cool. You also have bombs. And I know what you're thinking. Inferno, you are a terrorist. You must love those. The sandwich. It makes you big and strong, just like in real life. You can hold nine of them. It's cool. When you're in this beefy mode, you can move heavy objects. There is a specific boss fight where you can only kill them while in this mode. And then there is a shovel. You can use it to dig up items. It's fine. I rarely used it. But hey, if you want to go use it, uh, go right ahead. The horn. Apparently, it can activate events and areas and deal damage and knock down nearby enemies, according to the wiki at least. The final tool in the game is the bow. It's good when you upgrade it. Of course, this can be upgraded and be better as long as you upgrade your agility, but it is a very good ranged attack. Then there is food. Food can drop on the ground from killing enemies, destroying objects, and some of the animal orbs can just find it for you. There is a decent bit of them, like red and green apples, banana, pears, and cherries, which can all heal 10% of your health. And then there's a turkey leg, which just heals 50% of your health. These can all be found on just about any level. There is popcorn, which can heal for 1 HP, which is only found on a specific boss fight that I'll save for later. Then you got ice cream, chocolate cake, what looks like pumpkin pie, and a cookie. These can all heal 10% of your HP and can only be found on the wedding crash level. You can also find french fries, an egg, blueberries, which heal for 10% of your health, and a burger, which can heal 50% of your health in the lava level. And some candy in the snow levels, which can heal 10% of your health. And one of the most important parts of the game is the shops. 
There is a total of six of them in the main game and an insane shop after you beat the game. There is one for every area of the game. You can buy healing potions, bombs, and other tools, and even get weapons and pets, however those are more expensive. You can buy these by using gold, which can be picked up off the ground from destroying things, killing enemies, and beating boss fights. And the prices for certain items are cheaper at some shops compared to others. Like the snow shop sells a potion for 18 gold, meanwhile the swamp shop sells them for 11. My god, the American economy has really affected this world. Then there is the insane shop after you beat the game where you can unlock Hattie as a character, special weapons, and pets, and it is all really fucking expensive. But I don't really spend my gold much, so these weren't too useful to me, and I would just end the game with huge amounts of gold, but I still think they're pretty cool. But now that we got those parts of the game done, I think we can... Finally, move on into the next part of the game, the progression of the game, the story, and the boss fights. So yeah, it took us a long time to get here, but we're finally here, I guess. So the game opens up with Shadow Wizard Money Gang pulling up to the castle to rob the king of his crystal. And without words, you already have your objective for the game. Find the wizard man and get the crystal back. The story is extremely basic and honestly I think that is all it should have been anyways. The game barely has any dialogue or voice acting in it. So telling a story that was anything more than what it is, is just really stupid. We gotta make our way out of the castle and here we can fight the first enemies in the game. The Barbarians, who as I've mentioned way earlier in the video, can be a playable character. Oh yeah, and the most important parts of the story, they steal your bitches. No more bitches, you are bitchless. Outside the castle you can find yourself some Grey Knights and they can also fight alongside you and I think that's really cool. As AI allies go in video games, they're not horrible. Not a really high bar, but at least they try to help. Eventually, you can meet face to face with the first boss fight in the game. This is called the War Machine. It's a pretty easy boss fight. I don't see why a new player would struggle here. The attacks are very basic. It will mark spots on the ground and chuck bombs at you, and move around and try to ram you. But sometimes it will stop, raise itself, and spawn a few barbarians. A decent first little boss fight to open the game. Then you got the next boss fight after that, the Barbarian boss. He's a big beefy man with a spiky shield thing on his back. His attacks are something, you know, he's got his punch, he can jump and slam you with his little back shield thing. And his other attack where he takes his shield off and shoots spikes out to hit you. And when his health gets low, he can pull out a monster energy and burp at you to death. A pretty good boss fight in my opinion. I could see newer players struggling against him, however, I am a god so I destroyed him, and this is one of the first major boss fights. After killing him, a chest will drop and explode with gold, and then you can cut down the red princess and- Hey, this is a kid's channel, knock it off! Mama! After that, we make our way into the thieves forest. This level contains thieves, and later on the level, these little creatures called trolls. There is something off uh, about this level. The ground keeps shaking and making all the animals shit themselves, I mean that literally. The mini boss for this level is the troll mother. They really don't do much. Their only attack is spawning more trolls, and in my opinion, it is probably the worst boss fight in the game. After that mid-ass boss fight, you then get chased in the world's longest barn by a big troll thing. Look at me doing a perfect run without getting hit. Man, I am so good at this game. We then find ourselves in a river and then get our second major boss fight, the catfish. This boss fight used to piss me off when I was younger. It's a good challenge, especially when you are underleveled. This fight can be somewhat annoying though, mostly because it is in the water, and good luck trying to stay on an object to stay afloat. The attacks are aren't too complex, it can smack you, swim around, and dash at you, and spit a furball at you. Yeah, thanks for that. We then find ourselves in a grass field where we gotta fight a bunch of furries. And then our next mini boss fight, a bear. He can just spin around and then smack you with a sword. Again, kind of an eh mini boss, nothing crazy at all. We then enter a cave later in the level to fight a giant bat. The bat can either lick you, or shits all over the place. A fine enough boss fight, I don't see anyone struggling with this one, especially if you are at least like level 15 at this point, which you definitely should be. 
I would be confused how you aren't. There is this factory level with a bunch of fencers, industrialists, and a random brute for some reason. The boss fight is this industrial machine controlled by this bum. The only way to kill him is by destroying these weird generator things that pop out of the ground that can also electrocute you. His attacks are a giant robot hand and a gun that shoots poison or something at you very weird to have this kind of tech in what seems like the medieval times. There is a level where you can crash a wedding. I love crashing weddings. You can fight the cone heads here, and the boss fight is with a cone head. He can either try beating you with a lightsaber or start playing a piano that can bomb you. It's a fun boss fight. It, it's really stupid in concept and I love it. Again, whenever it, the piano is going to shoot bombs, uh, just like the war machine, it will mark where the bombs are going to land. And he also has lasers protecting him, which if you run into them, you will take a lot of damage. When you kill the cone head, a cyclops starts crying and then steals the bitches from you yet again. So you jump out and hop on their carriage. This specific part of the game is just so funny to me because I tend to usually just pick up and throw every enemy off the carriage and it gets the job done. You can even have a boss fight with the big troll from the barn. This fight is fucking pathetic. It is so easy. Stay at range and use your projectiles or bow, and it's easy. He can shoot eye lasers like he's Cyclops, but who cares? He will die before even attacking half the time. You then end up in the lava world and get yourself a boss fight with Cyclops. This, this is a good boss fight. His attacks are just slamming the ground or throwing knives at you, and it looks cool when he does it. When you kill him, he slips in the lava and a cute little Terminator reference. This is a personal favorite boss fight for me. I love it, it's so cool, and you even get the second princess saved. Further into the lava world, you can get yourself into a fight with a volcano with a face on it. This boss fight kind of blows. You can only beat him while eating a sandwich to become beefy, however he really only has one attack and it's shooting lava rocks that rarely will ever hit you. But then we get the next major boss fight, the dragon and sock puppet. This one used to be insanely hard for me when I was younger, and it still is a great challenge. But that's the best part about it, in my opinion. He's not a pushover like some of the other boss fights, and if you are a new player, he's gonna kick your ass no matter what. The dragon can breathe fire and do a bunch of damage, and the sock puppet can just spawn a boulder to crush you. It's a fun boss fight, and I love it. After killing him, you can see the necromancer resurrect the cyclops, and his design is cool as hell, oh my god. You also get the last relic. I haven't explained what these were before, because I'm not very organized with this video. But there is a boat that you need to go to to get on the other side of the map, which has the remaining levels of the game. There is three relics throughout the first half of the map that you need. Once you get all three of them, you can get on the boat and travel, and even fight on the boat. And it's really cool, I love this level. You fight ninjas and stuff, it's awesome. You then end up in a desert and can fight a bunch of weird bugs, and in the distance, you can see an alien building a pyramid. And then you get in the boss fight with an alien ship right after. It's alright, I'm not a fan of it personally. And because of my opinion on the fight, I got abducted for it. Oh god, they kidnapped the devs too! I think the alien ship level is pretty cool. It's a huge nod to the behemoths game they made before Castle Crashers Alien Hominid. By the end of the level, you have a time limit to get off the ship before it self-destructs. After escaping the alien hominid ship, you find yourself in a sand castle. There is a part where you play volleyball against the enemies, and it is a 1v4, how the hell is this fair? It's a bit weird to control in my opinion, and I'm clearly not very good at it, and something I probably would never try again. Later on past the sand castle, we can find our way into a forest that then leads to a farm, and we can then fight an angry corn. His attacks are pretty straightforward, arm whip can go underground to avoid you, spin attack, and can shield himself. It, it's a good boss fight, I have no complaints. He wasn't really hard, but it was somewhat fun. Then after we get into what looks like a temple ruin, where you fight fish and shit, and then we meet our next major boss fight. Okay, before I continue, let me just say, for the record, I absolutely would. Ah! Medusa. Yeah, this boss fight was a cakewalk. I know in this clip I'm level 37, but I still expected a somewhat challenging fight. Maybe that's my fault for being overleveled. She can turn you into stone where you need to swing your joystick from side to side to get free, and she can throw snakes at you. But I erased her existence in mere seconds. How is this fair? Then move on to a mountain you need to climb up. 
and fight stone faces and try not to get hit by a boulder. Then make your way into a snow area where you need to fight Eskimos. And then getting into the next major boss fight, the Frost King. When entering his lair, he laughs in your face and taunts you with your lack of bitches. This boss fight is pretty good. I like it. The Frost King can do many things. He can teleport like the little bitch he is, make ice spikes come out of the ground, and make ice shards fall on you. And for some reason, we'll take a moment to laugh at you, like if you were a pathetic joke. The wiki labels this as an attack, maybe on your feelings, but this is when you beat the living shit out of him. When you kill him, you save another princess, and that is another woman acquired. After that, we make our way for the wizard's castle, and we gotta fly ourselves up there. And here we get our final four boss fights. First up, the painter. Who the hell is this guy? I, I don't know, he just kind of exists now. He will paint up random things that come and hurt you, and then hide away until he feels the need to paint more. And that's all he does, but it's a really cool boss fight. He will also drop food when you kill him, and this is the only boss that will do that, which is weird. I mean, besides the corn boss. Next up, the undead cyclops. This fight is fine. He can jump around on a coffin like a pogo stick. The dead groom can come out to try and kill you and he can just smack you with the coffin. This one is more of a challenge than the painter, and it can be somewhat fun, but it does feel a bit bland and a bit disappointing considering his original boss fight before you killed him is way better. Now, if you die in this part of the game at all, it will actually save your progress. So you just gotta kill the cult minions to get back to the boss fight you died at, and thank God for it. I don't know if the original was like that, but man, I was stressing so much that if I died, I'd have to redo it. And the final of these three boss fights, the Necromancer. You walk into a room with dead bodies, and he comes in to resurrect them. And it is really hard. I'm surprised I was able to even beat it without breaking something, because it is extremely annoying. The fight with the Necromancer himself is kinda good too. It's also somewhat hard. It's like fighting another Castle Crasher player. His attacks are pretty much the same as his abilities as a playable character, except probably more effective here. After beating the Necromancer, we get to battle the final enemy of the game, the Evil Wizard. And this isn't just a two-phase boss battle, not even three. He has six fucking phases. Phase one, he spawns crystals that you need to destroy. Phase two, he is surrounded by a bubble. When the bubble is blue, he can only be attacked with magic, which I didn't find out till writing this video. And red, which he can only be attacked with melee weapons. Phase 3, he turns into a balloon. Phase 4, he turns into a big ass spider. Phase 5, he turns back into a balloon. Phase 6, it's just a sword fight between you and him, and it is a really intense boss fight. It is in extremely challenging, at least it was for me. Granted, I am ass at video games, this should be common knowledge already. But it was also really fun. Despite the six phases, it was really good. However, if you die towards the end of it, uh, yeah, have fun, you gotta fight through all six phases again. After defeating the evil wizard, the credits start rolling, as that is the end of the game. You've beaten it. Congratulations. When the credits end, you are now at a huge party because you just saved the world. Good for you. As you go to kiss the orange princess, yeah, that happens. And that is the end of the game. Upon beating the game, you unlock insane mode and the insane shop, which of course, as I said earlier, has overpriced weapons. I don't really have much to say about insane mode. It is pretty much just the main story, but harder, and you can get even more XP for your character out of it. Basically a new game plus, and it pretty much relocks every level you completed, and yeah, that's really all there is to it, nothing too special. And yeah, the story is nothing special in the slightest, it is very bland, and that is perfect for a game like this. This isn't God of War, no, because this game is actually fun. It prioritizes gameplay, and yeah, it's great here because the gameplay is really good. With the main story and all the main game stuff done, though, finally, it, it took us forever. Let's move on to the next subject. The side modes. So the mini games, there isn't that many of them. With the current PC and remaster of the game, there is only technically two. And each version of the game had a different mini game. Arena was the only one to appear in all of the versions. Arenas also exist in the main story, and I really didn't talk about them because I don't care about them. If playing solo, you just fight a bunch of waves of enemies, but with other players, it's just a battle between you and your friends. And for the arena side mode outside the main story, I guess there's four different modes for it. Melee, which is a sword fight. Quick draw, which is a bow fight. Beefy, which is just 
everyone in beefy form beating the shit out of each other. And treasure, where you need to dig up gold to kill the opponents. And apparently there is a team mechanic where you can align yourself with other players as a team. I rarely played Arena, if ever, outside of the main story arenas, but this does sound somewhat fun, I guess, so go try it, I don't know. The minigame that is in the current version of Castle Crashers, Back Off Barbarian. It's kind of boring. You are thrown on what looks like a game board and need to move around. Each space requires a different button press to move to that space. And the goal is to survive as long as you can while avoiding enemies from crushing you. It's kind of boring in my opinion. The few times I played it, it was just kind of okay and I didn't really enjoy it a lot. But the developers seem to love it so I can't really knock it too much. It's actually somewhat enjoyable if you at least got one other person with you. But playing it solo is just kind of boring. But then we got the other minigame. All you can quaff, quaff, yeah, let's go with that. Yeah, this deserved to get replaced. You pretty much need to spam the X and Y buttons on your Xbox controller to eat whatever food is in front of you, and press A to get more food. This was the exclusive game mode on the Xbox 360, and it's stupid. If I tried playing it, I probably would have to buy a new controller after. The developers even said they removed it because it was pretty much just all you can eat, which was a game mode in Alien Hominid. And yeah, it makes sense. I wouldn't want to be reusing game modes in my other games either. And yeah, it just kind of makes sense. And the final mini game, which was exclusive to the PS3, Volleyball. Listen, I still think it's weird to try and play volleyball in this game. But I wish this was on the remaster alongside Back Off Barbarian. You can just choose who you battle against in a game of volleyball, and it's stupid fun. I remember loving it, despite being horrible at it, when I did play it on my PS3. Honestly, if they could add an update that puts us back in the game, I would be so happy for that. Please, Behemoth, watch this video and listen to me. And that's really all there is for the minigames. There isn't much to say in them. Easy to understand and simple games to play on the side with your friends, and if in case you already beat the main story and want something else to do on the game. And I can really respect that. Well, me personally, they do not take away any appeal from the main story and really don't add much at all to the experience, in my opinion, but I still like that they decide to add extra content when they didn't have to. And with the final bits of the gameplay done, let's just move on and talk about the extra stuff like the art style and music and other stuff. <laughs> The thing with all of Behemoth's games is their art style. It's kind of like a trademark. The Castle Crashers art style was made by the Behemoth's lead artist, Dan Paladin. Yeah, the guy they show you when they open the game, he is real. I love the art style. It's cute, it's charming, just like every other Behemoth game. And I like that they all have a similar style. It gives their game a sense of familiarity and personality and makes their game stand out amongst the crowd of other games. Like when you see Alien Hominid, one of two things comes to mind, either that's a behemoth game or Castle Crasher looking ass. I love how all the characters look, especially the main knights. While in game they are just a basic color, their icon though, like the orange knight or the red knight or even the blue knight, go hard. Feel free to screenshot. The boss designs too are amazing. The Frost King, Undead Cyclops, Necromancer, in my opinion, are the best ones and look the coolest. But there is really not a single bad character design in the game, and even the levels are very well designed. They look good, they are all unique and stand out. Even the desert levels, can't say it's too interesting considering it is a desert after all, which we all know. Deserts are mid. This post was by Lava World Gang. I really love when games have a specific cartoony art style. That is also why I love Cuphead. Only on Tuesdays. Despite the game getting a remaster, it graphically has not aged in the slightest. None of their games have and probably never will. If you tell me this looks like shit, I will throw a brick. Hey, I heard about the dude from 4chan that got arrested too. I'm not taking any chances here. Now, the game's soundtrack. With a total of 40 tracks, I think only one of them is uh, copyrighted. At least it seems like it on YouTube. Not sure. Some of them aren't though. The only one I noticed it with was the title music, which is kind of sad because it is one of the best ones. Some of the best ones though are like the music on the world map and Barracks tune. The outro music I have been using. I love the soundtrack, it's not very dynamic, and it does kinda just loop in game after the song finishes. But who the fuck cares, this is good music, this is real music. Go listen to the soundtrack yourself, and trust me, you will become a whole different man afterward. In all seriousness, it's a beautiful soundtrack, which was created with the help of some new ground members. 
Yeah, the behemoth would contract about 20 Newgrounds users to make some music, and yeah, they chose some really good ones. Like Flutie, the map music. Truly magnificent. You also, again, have the barracks tune. This one I like because it has a bit of goofy sound to it, and it's just fun to listen to. You also got Spanish Waltz, which can be played when you are in a shop. Also, Gold Grab, which plays at the end of boss fights when you collect the treasures. It's so good, man. I love it. It's got a bit of dubstep in the soundtrack, which, I mean, come on. It was 2008. Who the hell wasn't listening to dubstep back then? I say this like I was one of those people, even though I was barely a toddler, and I went to the theater to watch Wally. -E. This is completely unrelated to the video. But I really love Wally. -E. The music is also very fitting for each level, and again, just sounds amazing. I love it despite some of it being dubstep, which, let's be honest, is a really stupid genre of music. But at least it's not country. So now, I want to take a bit of time kind of away from the game and talk about the developers of the game, The Behemoth. These guys are, if you couldn't tell and didn't know at this point already, even though I said it in the damn intro, they are an independent developer. They were originally created in 2003 by John Baez, Dan Paladin, Tom Fulp, Brandon LaCava, and Nick Dryberg. Apparently later on, Brandon and Nick would leave the company at one point, but hey, did you know Tom Fulp created Newgrounds? The origins of the company are pretty simple too. Tom Fulp and Paladin were working on Alien Hominid, which started off as a flash game for Newgrounds. But then Baez really liked it and said, hey, put that on the Xbox. And so they did. And that then led to the creation of the Behemoth. That didn't actually happen. I just read what it said on Wikipedia and thought it would be funny to change it up. But unless the Behemoth responded to this, it is currently canon. As of now, they have only released four games since starting up at the moment, with Alien Hominid Invasion supposedly releasing this year, which would be their fifth game. And you bet your ass I'll be playing it. I think the Behemoth are one of my favorite game developers ever. I have only played Castle Crashers and Battle Block Theater. I know, such a fake fan. I will repent for my sins. But Castle Crashers is my favorite game of all time, with only one real competitor for that number one spot. And Battle Block is just peak and one of the greatest platformers ever made. Time for an hour long video on that game next. There are other games I am of course going to play after this. I'm probably late, but hey, why not? Uh, maybe I'll make videos on them. This is gonna age really bad, isn't it? But the devs are talented. They're an insanely small team of developers. Wikipedia says there's nine people currently working there. However, there is a part of that that says citation needed, so don't trust me on this. I really respect the developers, and I love the work that they've done. So, why don't we just move on to one final part of the game before ending it all. So, I don't know why I decided to put this in so late, but I'm doing it, why not? Co-op. This game definitely has it. You can play this game with up to four players, and it is really chaotic. I rarely experienced this game in co-op, because I have no friends. However, the few times I did, I could barely see what was happening, and we all kept dying. I tried playing it with a friend of the channel, Blast First, and yeah, go check him out if you want. But when I tried recording it, it turned into a PowerPoint presentation, so yeah, no game for me, I guess. But from previous experience, it is really fun. I remember when I was younger, I would play it with my stepsister, my cousins, and I tried getting my friends to play it, which I definitely do not have. Playing it in co-op does make the game harder, at least for boss fights, I think. With every player in your squad, it adds extra health to each boss to try and make it balanced. Because, yeah, if four players were able to fight the evil wizard while he had the same HP he does in solo, it would be a cakewalk. I definitely recommend playing this with a group of friends. It really makes it a great experience. This game, in my opinion, is definitely way more fun with friends. That being said, it is also way easier playing by yourself. But yeah, Castle Crashers is really just a great co-op game as well. Especially as a couch co-op game. Yeah, remember those? Developers used to make those. So now we reached the end. There really isn't much more to add about the game, so let's just finish off the video, shall we? To me, Castle Crashers is special. To a regular person, it just looks like a funny cartoon night game. 
that lets you decapitate people. Well, it is that, but this game just holds such a special place in my heart. It was one of the first few games I played when I first got into gaming over a decade ago. Jesus Christ. I have so many fond memories of me playing this game from when I was younger up until recently, too. This is one of those few games where I never really have a bad experience playing. I mean, hell, I never even talked about the performance of the game at all during this video, which I normally do when I make videos talking about games. And if you really want to know, it runs great. I mean, it has like bottom of the barrel requirements, so that should be expected, but still. The game has gotten me through the ups and downs in my life, and I mean that genuinely. Well, yeah, I do have other games that also help me get through it, and I do have a lot of other favorite games, but this one, th this game is just too personal for me. Hell, it is literally my persona here on YouTube. You call that laziness? I call that inspiration. I did mostly play this game by myself, because I usually am always by myself, but the rare times where I would play with other people, it, it always stuck with me. I made memories with this game that will stick with me for life. And yeah, I know a few of you dumbasses think that's cringe and are commenting, talking shit about me for it. I don't really care about it, to be honest. Kill yourself. Of all games that have this kind of connection with me, you probably wouldn't think it would be this. And I can't blame you either. On the surface, it is just funny cartoon night game that lets you decapitate people. But to me, it's a part of me. It's played a, such a huge role in my childhood, and yet I still fucking suck at it. Maybe there is other people like me who have this strange personal connection to Castle Crashers. And if you are one of those people, first of all, cool. Second of all, you might need some therapy. It is a genuinely good game. It pretty much does everything well, from the combat, the weapons, the playable characters, despite the overlap the leveling, the boss fights, the music, call me biased, because yes I am, and so are you, so shut the fuck up. In my egotistical opinion, I believe that the hit game Castle Crashers is in fact a masterpiece. It is. And if you disagree, well that's too fucking bad. Wait, why does the script say explode? And yeah, that is really all I have left to say. I know, I'm finally shutting up so you can all go home. Wait a minute, what the fuck are you doing in my house? If you played Castle Crashers, which you should, tell me, what did you think of it? Just a warning, if you don't like it, I will send you to the Shadow Realm, so be warned. And now, I really only have one thing left to say. Behemoth, Tom, Dan, anyone from the team, if you're watching this for whatever reason, which I doubt you are, thank you guys for making this game and thank you for making my childhood a lot better it got me through a lot and i am forever grateful to have experienced this masterpiece of a game also please let me make merch using my character in the future it'd be really funny and yeah that was the video it's over you can all go home please seriously get the fuck out of my house i'm recording this at three in the morning like the video please it would make me smile or something also do it for castle crashers so we can get a sequel also subscribe please i think it'd be really cool and it makes me happy and gives me the motivation to keep doing videos like this and if you enjoyed the video good now goodbye